everyone. Welcome to the Empower Series Online. My name is Clifton Johnson. I'm the founder of the Empower Series Incorporated. We're a 501c3 nonprofit organization that is brought to you by the generous donations of Comerica Bank, AE Media Group, and you. So thank you. If you want to find out more information about the Empower Series, visit our website, www.empowerseries.com. In the meantime, what we know today is that our guest is going to blow you away. Dr. Dennis Kimbrough, he's a best-selling author of five books. He's a writing partner and master trainer for the prestigious Napoleon Hill Foundation. He's a faculty member at Clark Atlanta University and a prestigious award winner of the Dale Carnegie Personal Achievement Award. So we can go on and on about all of Dr. Kimbrough's accolades in the past, but what we're gonna talk about today is what is he doing now to make an impact at a time where it makes all the difference in the world. Welcome to the Empower Series, Dr. Kimbrough. How are you doing today? Man, Clifton, how are you doing, man? It's good to see you. It's Dude, been too it long. Is. Yes, yes. <laughs> so you know, you know, we're we're gonna be throwing up some some pictures, man. In 2011, when I was when the idea of the Empower Series came to me, I reached out to you. I was looking at your website. I read your book back in 1991 in the early 90s, and I was just on your website. Didn't know you. And then I think I shot you an email, heard back from your wife or your daughter, whoever was managing your account. And I remember talking to you thinking, hey, you know what? I have no money, but I want to bring you in. <laughs> I just had a, had a vision. Work with me. And, work with me. <laughs> say what? Work with me. Work with me. <laughs> right, right. You, you know, it works something out. But, but the point is, this Empower Series is truly a manifestation of the principles that you talk about in Think and Grow Rich, man. And so I'm so appreciative of you and Pat and your team really deciding to kick us off in 2011. We'll talk more about that, but uh, but I'm just in heaven right now, man. Mm -hmm. talking. Hey! <laughs> we go way back and come way forward. I've been around for a while. Yes, yes, man. And I also want to tell you this. So my Aunt Zelma says hello. Oh, yes, we had a good yes. time. Yeah, man, I really do appreciate you spending time with uh, my mm -hmm. uncle and aunt back there in the day. And, and so thank you for that. And just thank you for being a true uh, a true partner, a, a partner with the Empower Series and being able to come on to our show today and drop some wisdom, which we definitely need at this time, don't we? Oh, without a doubt. Uh, yeah, you've heard me say it before. I got a sign in my classroom that reads, if you don't read, if you don't study, if you don't grow, you don't develop, if you don't go to the seminars, you don't go to the workshops, if you don't read the books and take good notes and sit in the first seat in the front row, another student will. And the day that you meet that other student, you lose. Because when you look at the seven laws of wealth, number one law, wealth begins in the mind, but ends in the purse. Knowledge is everything. And let me tell you some students is not just in academia. We're students of life. So that oh, just, it doubt. doesn't stop, right? The continue, continuation of knowledge, raising your goals, striving, stretching yourself. And if you think that you have arrived and you're maintaining, you're actually losing. Oh, without a doubt. And we'll probably get into this. He wrote 16 books. Um, Law of Success was his first book. And then the last book that he was working on was really Thinking Grow Rich, A Black Choice. But my personal choice of all the books that he's written Arguably, master key to the riches, master key of the, of the riches, is is my favorite. And Clifton, the reason why it's a favorite, because this is the first time in all of his books he defines success. He says that success is a six-pointed star, and you can judge, you can gauge wherever you are in life by the various points of this star. And the number one point of the star is peace of mind. And what is peace of mind? Is the absence of all negative emotions. Fear, anger, jealousy, hatred, guilt, grief. Now, why do I say that? Because I was piggybacking on what you said. You know, success doesn't have anything to do with money unless money is your goal. Success doesn't have anything to do with wealth and achievement. It's not how much. It's not how great. It's not how long. It's basically off of peace of mind and are you making progress? Because you can't define it for other people. It is an inside job. If you're weak, I can show you how to become strong. If you're slow, I can show you how to become fast. But if you suffer from low self-esteem and you don't know where you're going and 
You have no, you know, no idea of the future. You know, that's an inside job. I tell my students all the time, and even with the pandemic and everything that's going on, this is arguably, Clifton, the best time in, in, in the world to, to be on the planet. Why? Well, Malcolm Gladwell wrote a book called Tipping Point, and the basic summation of Tipping Point is that any problem can be solved if only enough people care. Well, at this particular point, you have the best thinkers, you have the best writers, you have the best leaders, you have the best uh, 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 influencers, you have the best thought leaders, and they're all focused on only one or two problems, to pushing everything aside to put their mindset, mindset, heart set, soul set, health set, on these two problems. One, racial injustice, and the other, this pandemic. And the pandemic will solve itself, and I'm not making light of it. I'm not, you know, I'm not being facetious or being somewhat aloof. If you look at the World Health, excuse me, the World Health Organization right now, Clifton, they track 10,000 diseases on a daily basis. Go to the website, and they follow the top 10,000 diseases. When I say top 10,000, everything from bloodshot eyes to cancer. CDC, on the other hand, they don't track the top 10,000 on a daily basis on the website. They chop, you know, they track the top 400. So you got the two institutes of health, and on a daily basis, they track 10,400 diseases. That's the bad news. The good news is not one was ever created by God. So what in the world am I saying? Well, when you look at disease, 50%, I mean, you go back to the World Health Organization, the National Institutes of Health, they will tell you that 50% of all diseases comes from the lack of adequate drinking water. Well, that might be the only reason why, you know, the Lord blew breath into your lungs, why you were placed on the planet. To go to a remote village, and I don't care where you go to Bangladesh or some of the areas in the savannah of Africa or whatever, and maybe dig a well. Now, why is that critically important? Because any opportunity and any benefit and any goals and aspirations that we have right now, the only reason why we can pursue them, because we are drinking water of a well that somebody else dug on our behalf. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. We are yeah. drinking from the well of those who have gone before us. You know, people ask me all the time, how did you get the impetus for, what gave you the idea for the wealth choice and this and that? Well, on, upon first blush, I had countless interviews and I was looking at all the folks who I interviewed. And at one time I just sat down and I just, boom, I said, millionaires on this side, folks who went on to do grand things and blah, 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 didn't have the, the wealth of these millionaires, billionaires. And I said, let me focus on them. Well, something else happened too, Clifton. I had a conversation many, many years ago, more than a decade ago with Andy Young. And I interviewed him several times, but this time it was, it was really profound because during the course of this conversation, he said to me, he said, you know, me and Dr. King, we integrated the lunch counter, but we never integrated the dollar. And I, and I just said, Mr. Ambassador, how does anybody integrate the dollar? And he said to me, sitting right at the table, someone has got to give us the attributes, the traits, the keys, the qualities of how to effectively compete in a capitalistic economy. And right then and there, a red flag went off in my head. A red flag went off in my head. And to fall back on what I said about we're benefiting from wells dug by somebody else, another time I was with the ambassador and he shared a story with me. He said one time he and Dr. King, well, Dr. King, they had a meeting and he called all his lieutenants together. And there was Ralph Abernathy, Andy Young, uh, Joseph Lowry, C.T. Vivian, all the paragons from the civil rights movement were all around this table. And Martin Luther King said to him, he said, fellas, we must be out of our mind to think that we can change this world. And he was just laughing. He said, but here's the good news. If we do change this world, if we do change this country, no one sitting around this table will ever see age 40. And everybody paused, Andy Young told me. He said, but the good news is untold generations will benefit and have opportunities that they never dreamed of simply because of the work that we are doing today. And I never let my students forget that. Because, yeah. you know, yes, I met uh, Joseph Lowry and I, 
interviewed C.T. Vivian. And I don't know how many times I literally bump chest to chest, whether it's in the airport or whether it's the AUC teaching coming out of the parking deck with John Lewis, Bernice King. And what people don't understand, Clifton, they had dreams and aspirations too that they placed on the shelf to do what had to be done at this particular moment in time. And I don't care if I ever saw them. I remember the last time I saw uh, Dr. Lowry, I was walking down Auburn Avenue. The last time I saw John Lewis, we were on the uh, AUC, uh, Atlanta University Center. The last mm -hmm. time I bumped chest to chest with Bernice King was in the Atlanta University Center. And I always did the same thing. I hugged him, I kissed Bernice King, I hugged them, I told them that I loved them, and I, all, and I always thanked them for the work that they did for me and these countless generations. Man, we are always, like you said, we're always standing on the shoulders of the people who've come before us. We gotta realize that. And then we gotta realize that people are gonna be standing on our shoulders. So we gotta bring our A game to the, to the table. Oh, without a doubt. And, and, and the folks don't understand that. I mean, that is profound that I mean, the goal is to live in a society in which you do not need a civil rights hero. If, right. you're an, if you're an economist, the goal is to live in a society in which you don't need progressive thinking. But when you have three individuals, when you have Bill Gates, when you have uh, Jeff Bezos of Amazon, and when you have Zuckerberg of Facebook, and you place all three together, and their combined wealth is more worth more than 160 million people who live in the country. That's why you need progressives. That's why you need it, because it's like the yin yang. Wherever the pendulum, how far it sweeps on one side, it's going to sweep the other side. So yeah. people don't think when they think of democracy and they think of capitalism, and there's only one capitalism, and that was the economic idea that was thought. I got the book back there in my study, man, uh, you know, Adam Smith. And who in the hell was Adam Smith? Well, number one, he was a moral philosopher. He was an abolitionist. He was anti-slavery. And he says in the book, there's only one form of capitalism. That's the capitalism that Smith professed. He said, I allow you to pursue your divine self-interest if it doesn't fend and doesn't have to, you know, with me, and you allow me to pursue my divine self-interest, and who's going to benefit? I.H. And who is I.H.? The invisible hand. Again, a moral philosopher, as he pointed to God. He said, I.H., you know, the, the moral good is going to benefit. But then Smith says, as soon as you block one party from pursuing their divine self-interest, it doesn't work. And that's why he said, that's why he was anti-slavery. Now, I mean, we have been blocked from pursuing our divine self-interest. So really what we live in right now is not a capitalistic economy. It's a socialism for the rich. It's a socialism for the wealthy. You know, it's... <laughs> well, let's talk, let's talk about the beginning because you talked about when you came out of Northwestern with your, um, with your degree, mm -hmm. you said, there was one thing that you wanted to find out. Why is it, you know, what's the difference between people who are living in, in poverty and the people who are living in wealth? And that was your, like, your, your burning desire to, yep. to solve that and to find that out. So tell me about the beginning, and then we'll get more into some of the principles that you discovered in your, in your work. Yeah, you're going, you're going back, and I'll never forget. Okay, so uh, I finished undergrad in 72. And I worked in corporate America. Uh, and that time, um, actually, wow, I'm blowing the dust off, excuse me, off of this. I was the first black male in the rotational program for Texas Instruments in Dallas, Texas. And then I took another job. I was the first black male in another rotational program for Smith Klein and French, which is now uh, Smith Klein Glaxo, who are front and center working on the, uh, the vaccine for the coronavirus. So I, I did my corporate time. In my last three years of my corporate time, I worked in, uh, I was a consultant in Chicago. So, you know, but I knew um, that I was going to go back to school and, and work on my doctorate. And while I was at Northwestern University and Clifton, the only reason why I selected Northwestern, okay, I select, I applied to Columbia, I applied to Northwestern, I applied to University of Wisconsin, I applied to Notre Dame and I applied to Rice University 
right there in Houston. I got into all schools but Columbia. I got I didn't get into Columbia. I got rejected by Columbia. But the fact of the matter is, and this may have something to do with it, I said, do not accept me unless you're going to give me a full ride. Gotcha. I, knew, I, I knew I had the background and I knew I could handle the rigor and whatever. And so yeah. everybody accepted me and gave me a full ride, a potential full ride, except Columbia Northwestern was the best offer. And we went to Chicago. And after my first year at Northwestern, I was becoming a little bit of ambivalent because right, right down the road, okay, I'm in Evanston, Illinois, but in Chicago, you have the Chicago School of Economics and I was thinking about dumping my entire first year at Northwestern so I could go to the Chicago school and study with Milton Friedman, George Stigler, James Buchanan, and the like. So, mm-hmm. I, so I said, no, I'm not going to do that to my wife and kids. I'm going to just stay here and I'm just going to go ahead and finish. Glad I did because the best advice that I, I got when I finished was from my committee chair. And he said to me, he said, Dennis, don't look at your degree as you know, satisfying one of the degree requirements for your for your doctorate. Look at your degree. Look at your dissertation as your first book. And my dissertation was on wealth and poverty. And right after I was uh, endowed with the degree, I turned to Pat, my wife, and I said, I know my first book. She said, Well, I'm glad you do. And I said, But I want to flip the script. I want to do a number of things. I just want to study wealth, and I want to study African Americans. And so. Um, uh, she said, well, how long will it take? I said, well, I got to get the data. And I'm telling you right now, it's going to be a quantitative versus qualitative study. In other words, face-to-face interviews. And she asked me again, how long will it take? And I said, I know I can do it in 18 months. I quit counting after five years, but that's a sermon for another Sunday. But the fact of the matter is that, um, and I wasn't doing this, Clifton, to, to be the first or this and I, I, I found out that I was the first because there was no data on there. I mean, I said, come on, man, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm looking, I'm reading articles in Ford and Ford, Forbes and Fortune and this, and then of course, a few articles in Black Enterprise, but I was looking for longitudinal studies where these folks were growing over time and that, and we still don't do it. I mean, Clifton, you got 2 million black businesses out there, 95% of sole proprietorships, but you can count on one hand or both hands how many of them are in emerging markets. And that's right. what we need. We need businesses in emerging markets. We need businesses run by protagonists who at least pivoted once or twice. Now, why is that critically important? Because forget the Fortune 500. When you look at the Fortune 1000, I mean, they have, you take the top, Fortune five, you know, Fortune one thousand businesses, and what do they have in common? They have all pivoted at least one or two times before they reach, you know, their goals and objectives. And mm-hmm. what is the definition of pivoting? Pivoting is maintaining your strategy while you alter your tactics with no fear and no retribution about how much time and how much money you have done in the past. Some yeah. entrepreneurs will say, "I can't change my tactics." I've invested too much time, too much money. And I know all about pivoting because I was two years on what makes the great great when I met W. Clement Stone and the Napoleon Hill Foundation and he told me to push my book aside. And I was in that meeting in Chicago and I looked at that man like he was crazy. Oh, I ain't pivoting, bro. I put too much time, too much money. My wife is sitting out the car right there in freezing November weather in Chicago. We had to borrow the money for the plane ticket, borrow the money for the hotel lodging, borrow the money for the rent a car, and I'm dirt poor right now. I'm not pivoting, brother. This this train is not stopping. So I mean, but 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 that's where we are, and that's the thinking that we have, we have got to have. So going back to Northwestern, that was the advice. And uh, five seconds after I was granted that degree, that was the only track that I was on. I took sick days, I took holidays, I took personal days while I was working to go ahead and uh, complete this task until something changed in year, between year two and three. I was a pharmaceutical sales rep. You heard me say this before, Clifton, a pharmaceutical sales rep, and I was working the territory near my house, and I just got through making a call, and it was about lunchtime, and something resonated in my mind, do you want to go to McDonald's fast food and get a hamburger or do you want to swing by the house and maybe 
heat up some leftovers. And I said, let me go buy the house. And I went by the house because it was in my territory. And while I'm home, the phone rang, didn't have the slightest idea who it was. There was no caller ID, no call away, no nothing. I picked up the phone and who was it? It was John Johnson of Ebony Magazine. Not his administrative assistant, not his secretary. It was John Johnson calling me. And if I wasn't home right there, I would have missed that call. Now, why was it critical that I had a chance to talk on the phone and set the interview up with John Johnson? Because it would have been so much easier for me to get everybody else if I told them I got the king of the mountain. So that was critical. My wife came home from work. She was an accountant at the time. And I said, man, girl, well, I wasn't home. I would have missed that call to no telling how many phone calls that I've missed. I think I need to do this full time. And again, she said, all right, let's 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 think strategic. How long is it going to take? And again, uh, that was something that we did. There were times that she quit and I didn't, times that I quit and uh, she did, but we never quit together. Okay, so one of the things my Aunt Zelma told me is the key to um, building wealth. She says, you got to pick right. So you definitely, <laughs> you pick right. Yeah, I definitely picked right. There were, there were times when she thought, did I pick right? <laughs> uh, yeah. But I definitely picked right, as uh, my fraternity <laughs> brother said, I married up. <laughs> Here you go. That's step number one. Yeah. <laughs> Let me just tell you, so, so you had this burning desire, Burn. and we talk about, we, we're going to talk about that a little bit, but I want to go even further back, because while you're figuring out what you want to do, and you're laying it all out on the line, trying to juggle a job, paying your bills, and then doing your passion, then realizing you've got to get to this pivotal, pivotal point to where you've got to pick one, right? And the one that you're picking is not the one that's the most secure, but yeah. it's the one that, that fulfills you going towards your dream. Going back even further, man, when you look at uh, Napoleon Hill, and what, what intrigues me is not really all that he went through back in the, you know, prior to the 1930s in writing his, uh, his Laws to Success and the, the Think, and Grow, Think and Grow Rich original book in 1937, yep. but the fact that in, towards the end of his life in 1970, he was in the process of writing that version, a version of his book for African Americans. Yep. And that intrigues the, the heck out of me. And then the foundation holding on to that book mm -hmm. until you come along doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. That you could not have planned that. Yeah, and that's yeah, that's a thin thread that we were all connected by. And to even, you know, to make the thread a lot thinner was the fact that, okay, so I had this manuscript of really what makes the great, great so many interviews. And just imagine, there was an entire section of what makes the great, great. If you pulled it out, that's really the wealth choice because it focused on economics. And mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the uh, Success Magazine caught wind of what I was doing because I had so many articles off of that book published at the time. And, you know, they contacted me, Scott DeGarmo, who was the uh, senior editor, managing editor at the time. He said, Des, we want you to write, you know, because they were looking to bring black readers into their, you know, the subscribership and everything. So they said, man, you need to write a series of articles for us about, you know, these black sales heroes and this, that and everything. And I gave them the manuscript. I said, take anything out that you want. He said, no, we want the specific. So that, that, that he would do that. And so I wrote three of those articles. And one of the articles W. Clement Stone had on his desk when I met him, that he read and he called me. I mean, just think that he would be motivated to read the article and call me. He didn't have my number. I'm gonna find this guy, I'm calling him. And, you know, it was on my answering machine when I got back from the interview with Earl Graves, bang. Young man, we heard of you. When can you come to Chicago? I would like to meet you. And uh, I returned this phone call the next day, and it was not like, you know, okay, I'll be there in 48 hours. I didn't have any money. It took us two weeks to go ahead and get the funds together. So there we are. And uh, uh, that was, so yeah, that was, a, that was all, that was fate. That was uh, the day, the moment, the hour, the minute, the second that fate, that destiny reached its hand out to me to see what I was going to do. And you mentioned it before, 
you know, when it came down to push came to shove between bills and this and that, yeah, I was going to take care of my family. My family's well-being was always first and foremost, but the book was right up there with, that's mm-hmm. all I had. That's mm-hmm. all I had. And I said, uh, you know, Joe in the volcano, let's jump in the volcano and see what's happened. I was going to find out what was on the other side of the curtain. And come yeah. hell out of water. I was going to find out, man. So, yeah. And uh, we look back at it now and there were so many teachable moments and lessons. And, you know, but, you know, W. Clement Stone told me, he said, if you want to find the answers to these questions, it is in this laboratory that you must find it. I can't write you a check and you go ahead and blah, blah, blah. But you came in here and because he asked me, so, well, why are you writing this book? And it's the same thing I've told you. I said, well, I wanted to find out the keys. Why I he said, really? It's in this laboratory that you must find. He's, yeah, man. So, so, so speaking of that, one of the first principles you talk about in Think and Grow Rich is that this is an inside game. Mm-hmm. Like you really got to search deep and find out what is that burning desire within you? What is your purpose? And, and a lot of people like to look at the outside. They like to look at, okay, what's out there making money? What's mm-hmm. out there, you know, what, what, what job is out there? What, what external factor out there gives me a good feeling? And then that's what I'm going to run with, as opposed to really being quiet and doing the inside work. Mm-hmm. So, so when you look at the principles that you've laid out in Think and Grow Rich, talk to me about what principles you think are the most fun, fun, fundamental principles that we all need to start with instead of going out there chasing the most shiny objects. Okay, well, uh, I, I got to uh, deflect to Napoleon Hill. Uh, 1937, just like you said, he came out with Think and Grow Rich, and there are 17 principles that he espouses in Think and Grow Rich, the original Think and Grow Rich. Number one, definiteness of purpose, mastermind, applied faith, going the extra mile. But principle number five, pleasing personality, all the way to cosmic habit force, principles five through 17, he says, the only reason why he came up with five through 17 is to get people to focus on the first four. So to answer your question, number one, definiteness of purpose. What is it that you want? What is it that you plan to do? Definiteness of purpose, mastermind. And what is mastermind? We see it all the time. If I be lifted up, you know, if two or three minds are, are joined together, it's the exponential effect. I mean, Clifton, you know all about engineering. Okay, well, there's nominal. One, two, three, four, five. Well, there's exponential. And what is exponential? One, two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 132. Two, big difference. And that's the exponential effect of thinking where you can tap into the mindset of others. Number three, definiteness of purpose, maxima, applied faith. Faith is not an act. Faith is visionary. Faith is seeing, you know, taking the first step without even seeing the staircase. Excuse me, staircase. You know, Mm -hmm. faith is believing in yourself when no one else will. It is that persistence. And what is persistence? It's the level of belief in yourself. And that's arguably... When you look at the 10 forms of wealth, one of the forms is persistence. That was the form of wealth that I was going to use. I just wouldn't quit. I just wouldn't. You know, persistence will get it for you. Consistency will help you get it. You know, it's like, you know, um, you know, all, all the folks, Clifton, that we're enamored with, all the folks, the entertainers, the athletes, whoever, uh, the wealth creators, that we try our best to emulate, that we look up to, that we revere. Well, at one time, Clifton, they were ridiculed, they were scoffed at. So what in the world did they do? How in the, how in the world were they able to reach their goals? And well, they were hungry, that definite of purpose. They had a hunger. Now, 95% of people that when they're chasing their goals and their dreams, yeah, they're hungry and they're using that hunger, but after they reach their goals and dreams, that hunger fades. Well, those individuals that, that we look up to and uh, that we, you know, oh, man, I could never be like you, blah, blah, blah. They're not only hungry when they reach their goals and objectives, they maintain the same hunger after they reach the peak. And what happens to them? That's when they dominate. 
I don't care if you look at Beyonce. I don't care if you look at Michael Jordan. I don't care if you look at LeBron. I, I don't care if you look at, I mean, Jeff Bezos. I don't care if you look at Zuckerberg or whatever. Yeah, they, they hit their goals and objectives, but they still got their foot on the pedal. And what are they doing? They're dominating. And, yeah, and, and that is the crux. That is the highest point. You know, I talk about it in the wealth store. That's conviction. And what is conviction? It's a force multiplier. It is a force multiplier that leads to the passionate, committed mind, which can never be defeated. And then last but not least, definite purpose, mastermind, applied faith, always going the extra mile. Always going the extra mile. The individual that does what he or she's only supposed to do, well, you get a paycheck. But the individual that goes in above and beyond what they're supposed to do, well, what do they get? Well, they get opportunity. Yeah. They get opportunity, man. Big difference. Big difference. And that's what you see right now. That's what's different about this generation. Okay, you look at my father's generation. They call it the greatest generation there. They marched. They picketed. And they were basically bought out. They were given, you know, placated with government jobs and some opportunities at the margin. So you look at my generation. Yeah, we marched and we picketed. And what did we get? We got invited into the corporate arena. But what I love about this generation right here, Clifton, they marched, they picketed, and you can't buy them out. Only one thing that they want. They want you to invest in their business, invest in their enterprise, invest in their opportunity so they can build, grow, and get as far away from you as possible. Hmm. That's what they want. And we see it all the time. I mean, you look at Shaquille O'Neal and you look at uh, Dwayne Wade and you look at Jay-Z and you look at LeBron. When that, whenever they are asked to endorse a product, no, you can't pay me. What little, I, want a, I want an equity stake in it. Yeah, yeah. No, you know, I'm not, no, I don't want to pay to anybody mention paycheck. No, I want an equity stake in this. You're not going to buy me off. I mean, yeah, yeah, me and you are going to be partners. That's what we're going to be. <laughs> whether it's Dwayne Wade with Vizio or whether it's, um, you know, LeBron James and, and so many of his business enterprises or with Shaquille O'Neal with, um, you know, Papa John's Pizza or a Ring whatever i mean they they are you know expanding their bandwidth and like i said that's what we need we need emerging markets and then and they finally they, they got the email because clifton in the 1960s i mean i just love that story man you got malcolm x and he's on a book tour and he's crisscrossing the country going to every college and university across the country promoting his book while well, he was at a pwi and he's giving his talk, and in the audience is a young white female student. And after his talk, she runs up to him and says, Minister Malcolm, oh, man, I love your thinking. I love your words. I love your stories. I love your mindset. There's got to be something I can do, Minister Malcolm. I know I'm white. I know I'm female. There's got to be something I can do in this movement. Tell me something. What can I do? Malcolm X slowly takes off his glasses, cleans his glasses, looks the young girl in the eye and says, nothing, and walks away. Well, days, weeks, months pass by, and Minister Malcolm thought about what he did, and he knew that he just avoided a teachable moment. If he were here right now, I know exactly what he would say. What can we do? Number one, we need to go to the Fortune 500, Fortune 1000, and tell them, what we want, we want 5% of your profits. Take the profits of 2019, 5%, and we want you to put it into black banks, black financial institutions. That's what we want. Clifton, right now, all right, you got 4,000 banks in the United States. You go from New York to California, you got 4,000 banks in the United States. Only 38 are black owned. Uh -huh. Only 38 are black owned. Now, why do you want the Fortune 500 to invest? Because when you look at these 38 black-owned banks, look at their average investor. Look at their average customer, their consumer. They're low-income folks. And what does that mean? Okay, they got very small deposits, and they got multiple withdrawals. In other words, you can't get the compounding effect, you know, from the investment. 
But you let, you know, the Fortune 500 come in there, and I'm not saying just 5%, it's going to be billions, whatever, but it's going to be multi-millions, and you ask them to commit to leave it in that bank for no less than five years. You know, what, what is five years? 60 months. So we can, you know, benefit from the compounding effect. So that's number one, okay? Number two, you got to invest in HBCUs, man. You got to do it. I mean, right now, you take all the HBCUs out there, historically black colleges and universities, and there's about 100 of them. In total, Clifton, you got 300,000 students. And these just aren't any students, just a minuscule, only 5% of all the black students in the United States in these colleges. But what makes these 300,000 students magical? From this 5%, you get the majority of your black doctors. You get the majority of your black lawyers, your black dentists. Yeah. Yeah. You get the majority of your black teachers, black engineers, man. These are magical students. And you, get you, get, you, get your, you get your Democratic vice president you candidate, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So you, you, you couldn't pay for that, man. And then last but not least, what we're asking, man, and, and this is critical. Number one, invest in them. Number two, entrepreneurial effect and HBCUs. And last but not least, man, um, got to find a way to narrow and to flatten the yeah, air. There's two curves that we got to flatten. We got to flatten the pandemic and we got to flatten the wealth gap. We got to close the wealth gap. And again, goes back to Black America's most prolific scholar, 1897. The man and woman won't control his or her finances, won't control anything else. And nothing positive will ever occur in a community that fails to circulate its dollars. Well, you definitely go into more detail of uh the financial strategies for millionaires in your, in your most recent book. But going back to the point that you were making, the first four principles that Napoleon Hill talked about, mm -hmm. is very, you know, when I look at the Empower Series and what we're doing, we definitely want to ensure that every, everything that we do with all of our programming, this, workshops, everything, we want to accomplish four things. We definitely want to give people hope, hope that they can achieve whatever they envision. We want to inspire them to take action because any idea is not acted upon is not going to produce anything for you. And then we want to, oh my gosh, yes. And then education, critically important. Education comes from academic as well as in life. You want to continuously learn. And then the third, the fourth thing is to be connected to the resources around us. They're all around us that people are not aware of. People don't know about your books. People don't know about the SBA and the resource partners that are out there that can really help you take your vision and your idea to the next step of fruition. So with that being said, you know, a lot of times we focus on strategies and the Empower Series talks about financial literacy, life insurance, estate planning, um, preparing for college. But the first thing that we start with in January every year is visioning and goal setting. You know, spending some time working on what is your vision? What is it that is your, your burning desire that you want to manifest? And then this month, the reason why we're talking and we're, we're in this conversation is about developing the growth mindset and the right mindset to make these external things work, to put you in a position where you can, um, you can start a bank, to put you in a position where going to school and positioning yourself educationally wise to be in a profession that you're going to excel in. Um, so I, I just don't want to, want to gloss over. A lot of times people are thinking about what strategies do I need to implement? Where do I need to save? Where do I need to invest? It's like you need to invest, number one, in yourself first and really get yourself and your foundation strong so that you can definitely take advantage of these other opportunities that are around us. And so you mentioned that in your book. So, so um, any other points in your first book Think and Grow Rich that you think uh, people need to uh, latch on to? Because I'll tell you, you, you first published this book in 1991, right? 91. Yeah, I think it was August 20th, which is my daughter's birthday, right? <laughs> uh, she was born in 86, but, but that's going to be 30 years next year. So congratulations, man. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, thank you very much. But I'm, I'm humbled and uh, I'm honored because the only reason why it's been, when you look at Amazon and the top 100 and uh, African-American demographic it has always been there, it's because of individuals like you. It's because of individuals like your daughter and, uh, you know, uh, folks who just hungered for this information and just wouldn't let it go. So basically, Clifton, all I've been doing is writing the coattails of this book and, and trying to, you know, there's only, and you heard me say this before, there's only two reasons why anybody would either want to read the book or come hear me speak. Is because I just want to know, can he articulate the book as well as it's written? And that's basically it, a seven-year ordeal. And over the seven years, I just, uh, yes, it was a divine intervention, but I was sweating over every word, every sentence, every paragraph, every chapter. <laughs> well, man, let me tell you, though, you... Um... You definitely took the baton because Napoleon's Hill book, I think when he passed away, had sold around 15 to 20 million in the 1970s, but definitely today, well over 100 million copies have been sold. And then your book is just continuing that. They passed you the baton and you, you're doing your job. You are doing your thing and, and your passion is, is teaching. So you live in it, right? You live in it. <laughs> I remember when we, when we brought you out here on a Thursday a couple of times, we, you know, right after your class, you got on a plane, got off a plane, I drove you to the event, right? <laughs> hey, right when you were hot, you were hot. <laughs> Man, I had to take a, I had to take a five hour energy because the same way that I come across when I'm presenting with you, that's the way I am. And I got back to back classes, man. Whoa. Hey, man. hey well, I definitely want to make sure that people grab your book, Think and Grow Rich, A Black Choice. It is, it is uh, relevant today. And uh, like I told you before, if you look at my book, I'm still, I'm still using it. And, and, and I'll tell people all the time, you know, my son, my son it doesn't- looks, It looks like my copy, man. Here's my copy right there. <laughs> so, so my son uses Audible now, and I've been reading, and, and as I get older, I'm thinking, man, these, the print's kind of small. So I've been listening to your book via Audible now. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool, man. So, but now your, your, your most recent book, The Wealth Choice. Tell us about that. Now, there's seven, there's seven um, laws that you've come up with that uh, through your interviews with black millionaires, you found, and, and a, lot, a lot of those laws are, you know, some of them are not new, but, but it's definitely an update from your, 2000, or from your 1991 book. Tell us about that. Yeah, and you know, again, mentioning the fact that, okay, so I had all this information on black millionaires and I was just trying to find a way Clifton to validate it. And so I had a presentation at um, the Federal Reserve and uh, a couple of the social scientists at the Federal Reserve who knew me and were familiar with my writings and said, Dr. Kimber, what are you working on now? And I said, well, I'm trying to uh, you know, write this study on black millionaires, but I got a little bit of a problem. I said, what is that? I'm trying to find out exactly how many of them are. And, he, and they said, oh man, that's easy. They said, you got two choices at the time. And Clifton, this was, this was like 2006, 2007. They said, you got about 112,000 African-American households with a net worth of a million or more, or you got 35,000 individuals you know, who are certifiable millionaires based on, you know, uh, uh, first home minus assets, minus liabilities, when you remove all those, and they really have a net worth of 4 million or more based off of the Federal Reserve. So, you know, I took that data and one day I'm teaching my business community, uh, business communication class to MBAs. And we had a case that we were going to go into when I said, uh, I told my students, I said, before we get in the case, I got to ask a favor of you. And I gave them all a mock-up of a survey that I was using. And I said, when you guys have a chance, you're the experts, you're, you know, you're a candidate to, for your MBA at the end of this year. Tell me if I'm on to something. Take as much, <clears throat> excuse me, take as much time as you need. And because I asked them 118 questions. 
Well, Clifton, they were so enamored in that classroom about that survey, they just scrapped my case study for that day and all the notes because I was ready to dig into it, man. I said, well, we don't talk about that case was boring anyway, man. We wanted it so and I was just uh, I didn't have any information, so I just had some posted notes and I was just taking notes for my students. And, and I, I explained that in the book, I had posted notes from my students and I put it over here and I said, let me follow this and the other. So again, this was, a, uh, this was more uh, quantitative than thinking we're rich. So number one, I used a full blown survey, 118 questions. Number two, I organized six focus groups around the country. I had one in Washington, DC, had more than a hundred uh, black millionaires uh, in Washington, DC. I had three in Atlanta. I had one in Omaha, Nebraska. I had one in Las Vegas um, uh, for a, a total of six. And so last but not least, I said, well, I need some face-to-face -face interviews. And Clifton, it was at this juncture that I absolutely positively said, no athletes, no entertainers. But when I put the list together, okay, so who am I going to go after? I had to revamp that and I had to pivot Obviously, there were some folks I had to include. So I tried to get, um, you know, folks with a little brand recognition, Tyler Perry, Kirk Franklin, Steve Harvey, uh, folks of, of that ilk, three black billionaires. And my interviews went as long as two days. I spent two days with Kathy Hughes, one of our black billionaires, to no less than two hours. Um, got a chance to speak to Steve Harvey a couple of times and our first interview was uh, more than two hours. I spent mm, spent a half a day with Kirk Franklin uh, and just on and on and on and on and on trying to, but the, the high watermark of this whole thing wasn't the one-on-one -on -one interviews, it was the focus groups because in the focus groups, um, Clifton, I got a chance to see the way they operate with their peers. I was a fly on the wall and I got a chance to see how millionaires and I, all right, I know how you and I get together when we act, give me some that, let's kick a few, let's have and and it was just inter you know, interesting to see how they operate with their with their peer group. And with their peer group, no flaunting, no beating on the chest no look at me, completely engaging. How can they help? You know, what are the trends right now? How's the family doing and the like? So that was a real eye opener for me. Well, one of the things I see in both of your books, though, is you definitely talk about people, some people you've heard that people may, may know, some people that they don't know, but what's most important is that you distilled from them the attributes and the qualities that once implemented can help you be successful in whatever you want to do. So one of the things that you say about your books is that your books are, is not really about money. You know, it, it's really about, you know, those who are courageous enough to step forward and act on their dreams and ideas. That's one thing. The other thing you say is that this book crosses ethnicities, age, um, gender. It, it's like, it's not those factors. It's just your ability to follow these laws. And, and so there are seven that you mentioned in the wealth choice, the first one is, you know, wealth begins in the mind but ends in the purse. So it goes back to where the fundamental stuff is mindset and educating yourself and knowledge, right? Yeah. Um, and within each one of these, you talk about activities that can be done in the wealth choice as well as in Think and Grow Rich to where people say, well, how do I develop these, these attributes? Follow the exercises, you know, spend some time meditating, bring, sp spend some time visioning, spend some time getting really detailed on your goals and not being vague. So, so I want to go through. Asking, asking yeah. yourself the critical questions. Um, you know, what keeps you up at night? Um, mm -hmm. If I gave you a million dollars, what problem would you solve? Because uh, as, as I said, you know, there's a big difference between an entrepreneur and a small business owner. Well, small business owners, what do they do? Well, they run small businesses. What do entrepreneurs do? Entrepreneurs change the world. Entrepreneurs solve problems. So going back to one of the questions, if I gave you a million dollars, what problem would you solve? If I gave you a billion dollars, what problem would you solve? You know, the bottom line is watch for trends. You know, solve problems, solve solutions. You know, as Jack Dorsey at Twitter says, because I had a student 
who had a summer internship out in San Francisco. And when class was about to start, she'd come bolting into my office. I can really never believe where, where I interned. And I got a chance to meet Jack Dorsey at Twitter because he went around to all the interns, sat down at the table with them, and shared his two rules. And Jack Dorsey's two rules are, number one, there are no rules at Twitter. And number two, put your soul into it. Passion, <laughs> the passionate, committed mind. Mm -hmm. You said, just don't start a business, start a movement. Start a movement. Start a movement. And so the other thing you talk about is like, vow, decide right now that you will not, not be poor. Not be poor. Big difference between broke and poor. You know, <laughs> broke is just, a, you know, a short time frame, whatever. But poor, that's a debilitating state of mind. And you must vow that you will never be poor. Just like, you know, Victor McFarland, poverty would have no place in my life. The poor yeah. keep score by cars and clothes. The middle class keeps score by degrees and titles. But the wealthy keep score by their bank account. Vow that you will never be poor. And there are 10 different forms of wealth. Number one form of wealth is knowledge. Number three form of wealth is money. People say, how come money isn't number one? I mean, you know, <laughs> because uh, as I say, you know, wealth begins in the mind, but ends in the purse. Everything occurs to you twice in life. The inner, the outer, the thought, the thing, the mental, the physical. But number 10 is energy. You know, use your energy. Like I said, go back to health state. And you can see it. And I saw it in the, in the focus groups. How do the wealthy, how do the, you know, the affluent, how do the, the influence, you could just see the way that they walk into the room. There's an energy to them. There's a quicken to the pace. There's a fast step. Well, use that energy. And you're going to need your energy to do big dreams. You're going to need your energy to chase bold goals. Think big, think bold, think stretch, think global, think quantum leap. But damn it, you've got to think. I mean, that's the bottom line. Yeah, yeah. So your third one is believing in thyself. Believing in yourself when no one else will. What in the world am I saying? Clifton, everybody's got capabilities. You got, you're capable, I'm capable, my next door neighbor over there, everybody's got capabil capability. But what is the difference between the folks in the book and 95% of the people out here today? And we are, we're all capable, we all got capabilities. It's a belief in your capability. It is a belief that you are capable, that you are equal to the task. I mean, what, is the, what does the Bible say? Ma Bible says, Man, women shall not live by bread alone. What in the world does that mean? Bread, what is bread? Well, bread could be wealth. Bread could be, you know, your, your amenities, whatever. You know, Steve Jobs says it. You know, people will say, Steve, how does it feel to be one of the first, you know, wealthiest, youngest billionaire? He said, I'm tired of that question. I didn't do this for the money. And it's the same thing that I saw in the focus groups because money will not sustain you. You can't do it for the amenities. You can't do it for, as you said, you know, the bling, bling, whatever, because that will not sustain you. You got to have a deeper why. You got to have a bigger why. My, uh, my father, my father-in-law who passed away, he said this, he said, you know, you guys can be successful in whatever you want to be successful in, mm -hmm. but you got to realize that it's going to take your life. And, and so you don't want to chase money because you'll find that money is not worth your life. It has to be something bigger than just money. Money can be the output, but you know, when you pick what you want to be successful in, be, be very careful if you're chasing money. <laughs> oh, without a doubt, without so, a doubt. So the, the other one is finding your unique gifts. Mm -hmm. and, and again, there's exercises that you can go through within the book that kind of helps people feel, well, how do I find out my unique gifts? Mm -hmm. But that's, that's number four, find your unique gifts. Find your area of excellence. Find the number one reason why you are here. When are you going to place your fingerprints on life and prove that for you you were here? And it's said, uh, you know, it's it's somewhat introverted, but it's the easier process to do. I mean, what do you love to do? What do you have a passion for? What can you throw your whole heart and soul into? Question number two: What would you do for free? If no one ever paid you a dime, if no one ever gave you financial reward for your efforts, what would you do for free? And if you can't answer those two questions, go to people who you respect and admire and ask them, what do you see me as? What do you think I would be good at doing? 
I love sharing the story. Okay, go back, Clifton. Here we are, 1991, the book's coming out. I'm on a, a world tour with this book, and I'm speaking at the National Black MBA. And after I speak, the dean of the School of Business, Clark Atlanta University, corners me, gives me his business card, and he says, when can you and I talk? And, uh, you know, a few days goes by, whatever, and I get a break in the action. I gave him a call and said, you need to come down to campus. I want to show you the campus. I want to introduce. I want to talk about something. And what it was, he was recruiting me for a job to come on board. You know, and I knew that I was going to teach. And it was just a matter of time and whatever. So I made it my business. I said to myself, before I ever talk about, you know, you know, uh, to thy own self be true, Clifton. I never share this with you. I said, before I even step into a classroom, I'm gonna know exactly what I'm doing. I'm gonna seek out some of the best teachers, the top teachers in, the, in their class, whatever, to find out how I can scale, how I can take best practices. And I went all over the country. And I remember I went out to Stanford. I had a presentation at Stanford B-School and I made it my business to meet Dr. Charles Benini, who teaches at Stanford B School. I looked him up and I told him I wanted to meet him. And we were at lunch together. And why was it important that I met him? Because it was in his entrepreneurship class that Phil Knight got the idea for Nike Shoes. And I asked him, I said, when Knight, I know you knew Knight had Nike Shoes. I said, yeah, I, I knew about that. I said, did you know that he was going to hit the mother load? And he said, well, I had a good idea that it would be profitable, but I wasn't concerned about that. I just want to make sure that I was staying true to my vision. And I said, what is your vision, Dr. Benini? And he says, my vision is always to enable the dreams of my students. That was a profound statement. Um, that was a profound statement. And there I am, uh, went up to Harlem, New York, sat down with Walter Turnbull, founder of the Harlem Boys Choir, and this was, I interviewed him right after the movie Glory. And as you know, Clifton, they did the soundtrack in the movie Glory. And that sold, that, he was making money hand over fist with that soundtrack. I mean, it was a platinum bestseller, this, that, and everything. And he had experienced tough times. I mean, he really climbed the back stairs of success. So when I spoke with him, I really wanted to talk about wealth because now he was coming in, you know, uh, he was really uh, coming into his windfall, his cash windfall. And so I said to him, I said, Dr. Turnbull, what is wealth? And he went just like this. Wealth is hearing the voices of my boys. In other words, always staying true to the core, not getting caught up in all, you know. So with that type of thing, and I just wanted to find out best practices. Again, area of excellence. So how did I benefit from all that information? Well, I've been there more than 20 years, but three out of the 20 years, I was teacher of the year in the School of Business at CAU. And then one year, I was given the H. Naylor Fitzhugh Award, which is emblematic of one of the top business professors in the country. So uh, I've been blessed trying to do my homework, always trying to stay above the head of the curve, and just a, a, a deep desire for inquisition. Well, man, you're you're definitely the example of the uh, of the fifth rule, which is <laughs> serving others, right? Oh yes, <laughs> that's right. Servant <laughs> leadership, man. Servant leadership. You know what? A day. I th I thought today would be the first day this week that I didn't get a phone call, I didn't get a text, I didn't get an email. Someone didn't hit me up on LinkedIn from a former student. I thought today would be the first day that I could go through the day and one of and at Clifton, <laughs> I guess about five o'clock, I didn't get one. I got two ex-students, one in Houston, Texas, and one right here in Atlanta. And the one in Atlanta I taught in 2001, and the one in Houston, Texas, I taught in 2006. Dr. Kimber, I need to get your advice on something that's, you're so hard to kiss, what do you be doing? Where, where are you? You need to tell people where you are sometimes. I mean, they just track me down, man, like, <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, man, let me tell you what, what I like about our collaboration. So again, when I'm reading your book in the early 90s, I'm not thinking I'm ever gonna meet you. I actually looked at this book and thought, 
you know, why do I need to read this book when the original book was in 30 and 37? So I read it and it impacted my life, as you can tell, had no clue that I would eventually start the nonprofit of the Empower series with this event and reach out to you. Mm-hmm. I had no idea that we would develop the relationship we developed, but here's my thought when I was reaching out to you. My whole goal was to see how can our collaboration be a blessing to many more lives. And that's and, what you've done, yep. Dude, and, the, and we're not done because the work that you've done is still touching lives. There are people we expanded to Houston and there is a couple in Houston that didn't know about you and they found out about you through our YouTube channel and they started coming to our events in Houston. They're probably watching now. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just saying, man, there are lives but like, like uh, Napoleon Hill said, what the work that you're doing now is really going to be a blessing to lives that aren't even born yet. Mm-hmm. And so you are truly a testament to living these principles and these laws that you've, uh, you know, gotten from other successful people. You are definitely an example of that as well. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. You know, the last two is the road less traveled. So owning your own business, mm-hmm. definitely creating some equity ownership. Yep. Yep, the biggest mistake you'll ever make in life is to think that somebody else signs your paycheck. And I don't care whether you're a small business owner or whether you're an entrepreneur, I don't care if you're working in corporate, you're an employee before you launch out on your own. There's two positions, there's two jobs that you're working right now. If you're an entrepreneur, small business owner, operator, there are two businesses that you're running right now. Number one, the business that you're currently in, and number two, the business that it's gonna become in five years. Now, I know with the pandemic and everything, yeah, some of these businesses, Clifton, were going to close on their own. But mm-hmm. now, now that you are front and center with the business that you didn't know was going to become in five years, how do I go ahead and manage my state of affairs? So that's where your focus is right now. If you're an employee, you didn't know that, you know, your job, you are going to be working remote in virtually five years from now. Now, what do you do now to make sure that you are fit and focused to grab the next rung on that ladder moving up the corporate ladder? But the biggest mistake you will ever make is to think that you are not in control of your business and of your state of affairs. You add, you've got to add value every step along the way. You've got to be able to ride in on the white horse and save the day. Why is it going to be better? Because you are here, you are part of the team, you are running and owning this operation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. you incorporate it. How can you improve every day? Mm-hmm. And then your last law is really about making your money grow. Financial and, and, literacy. Yeah, man, Financial the five literacy. strategies. And the five strategies you've mentioned down there are definitely strategies that, that need to be implemented. And it's about being disciplined to make sure that you're spending within your means, you're controlling where your money goes, you're investing it, getting advice. And all of that is in this book, uh, Dr. K, so, man. <laughs> well, I got that first uh, first and, uh, and for, uh, foremost from W. Clement Stone. I mean, he was coaching me every step of the way, and he told me, you know, he, and he knew about my financial difficulties, and he would say, young man, it's not going to be like this forever. You know, just enjoy the journey, blah, blah, blah. And he said, but when you begin to hit your stride, you got to promise. He said, if you can't save 10% of everything that you earn, the seeds of greatness aren't in you. And, you know, I still got folks who, you know, family members, I know I live well below my means. Uh, mm-hmm. You look out there in my driveway and there's my Lexus SUV, you know, 2006. That car is, what, 14 years old, man. <laughs> 224,000 miles out of Clifton. <laughs> it drives my daughters crazy, man. Yeah, They're embarrassed man. to get in it. <laughs> Hey, my, my uncle and aunt are, you know, they are professors, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I talked about her writing a book about her principles of success. So number one, she said is pick, pick the right. You got to pick your right mate, number one. Mm-hmm. But they never spent more than they've made. They, um, she's never had to pay. I mean, she's always, she never carried a balance on a credit card. Mm-hmm. So whatever she charged on a credit card, they paid off, never had to pay, up, yeah. pay debt. And not going to put all of her business out there, but I would just say that not making an extremely high amount of money, they're definitely, uh, they lived a very well life. 
and very mm -hmm. blessed life. And so they could have been interviewed in, in your book. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll definitely know get them next favorite, time. Right? I got them on the list. <laughs> I got them on the list. It's like my wife said to me yesterday, she said she got a, uh, a message, an uh, email from uh, Nima Marcus. It said if she doesn't buy something soon, they were going to close her account because the balance is zero. And she said, don't close my account. She said, I got to go down there and buy an umbrella because I like my Nima Marcus. <laughs> <laughs> Well, man, we can keep going on and on. And, and so definitely, I want people to get your book uh, and comment to you. So, so how can people get in touch with you? What is your social media handles, um, LinkedIn? www.denniskimbrough.com. I'm on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Email me. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, I am just uh, love hearing stories of folks making a difference you know, really casting their net out there to change the world, as Steve Jobs says, you know, poking a hole into the universe. And that's what it's all about. It's called progress. And just like you said, Clifton, we've got to leave this a better world for not only this, but future generations. So in next year, you're going to go on a tour, your 30th year you anniversary. Go. So, yep. uh, so you got to like book them now, right? <laughs> <laughs> I will be front and center, man, all over the universe. Yep. Oh my gosh, Dr. K. So let me just ask you, what are some of, what's your closing message as we kind of wrap this up and uh, allow you to get, get back to your family and, and everything? What would yep. you want to close? Well, the, clo the closing message is, is the opening message. And let me highlight it. Let me underline it. Let me uh, place it front and center. Wealth is not a function of condition. It's not a function of circumstance. It's not a function of your assets. It's not a function of who your parents were, where you were born. It's not a function of your education, your brand, and your title. But it is a function of belief, and it is a function of ability, and it is a function of faith. And those men and women who have won most of their life have relied mostly on themselves. Well, Dr. K, thank you is, is so insignificant to express my appreciation. So the biggest thing that I, I know I can do is, is take the baton from you and carry it forward and really put into action to be an example of the principles and the laws that you espouse in your books and how you live your life as an example. So I want to thank you, man. God bless you. Say hello to the family and everyone. And uh, next time I'm feeling comfortable traveling and I come to Atlanta, you know I'm going to knock on your door. Yeah, there right? you go, man. Come on in. <laughs> well, Love, Zoom to right? Love to have you. Love to have you. I love you, man. I uh, love so you, thank too. You. you take care, Clifton. All right. And for All everybody right. who's watching, hey, this, share this. You know, don't keep this to yourself. Let somebody else know about this because there's somebody within your circle that can benefit from this. So one of the things that Dr. Kimbrough says is that if your current circle of friends do not inspire you, don't uplift you, then you need a new set of friends. <laughs> <laughs> and so there's somebody out there waiting to be your friend to help uplift each other. Uh, so until we meet again, uh, definitely uh, be empowered and inspired to thrive. I want to thank Comerica Bank, AE Media Group, and you for being a part of the Empower Series. Definitely go to our website, subscribe to our channel, and again, don't keep this to yourself. Be a blessing to somebody else and empower them with the knowledge that you know. Be well. Thank you for watching our Empower Series YouTube video. I really hope you enjoyed it. Remember to hit the subscribe button below as well as the little button to be notified the next time we upload our video. Until then, stay connected with us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever your social media flavor is. Inspire the world to thrive. See you soon.